In this school grad video, we're going to talk about roommates and how to find good roommates. If you talk to a lot of your friends and relatives and seniors who have been abroad for higher studies, they'll probably tell you that not all roommates are nice. And most people who have been abroad have had some good experiences and some bad experiences. I've lived in the United States for, you know, more than a decade now and in my student years and earlier years, I've lived with more than 30 to 35 different roommates from various cultures, countries, religions, and I've had a variety of experiences. And if you have good roommates who are really cooperative, then it can be really nice and you can have jolly good times and create sweet memories. But if your roommates are not cooperative, it can be one hell of an experience and it can really affect your performance at the university and also at work. So your frequency may not sync due to various reasons. So I'm going to tell you a lot of different experiences that a lot of different people have had with roommates, based on which you can avoid making the same mistakes that these people have made. And it's really important to find good roommates. And here we go. I'm going to give you a wealth of experience about, you know, and guidelines about finding right roommates. So with any roommate, there's always only a 50-50 chance of things working out well. So they're like two complete strangers, mostly from two different cities, you know, or even if they're from the same city in India, they don't know each other usually and they have to come and live together. They're strangers who are living together. And they try to, you know, understand a lot about each other's personality and usually it works out at sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. So, a lot of young boys and girls think it's going to be a lot of fun, you know, if they're coming out of home for the first time, away from their parents. They think they're going to be living with people of their own age and they're going to have a lot of freedom, you know, like birds freed from the cage. And they think it's going to be a jolly good experience. But people have made a lot of mistakes and a lot of people have suffered. And... If you talk to the people who have lived with roommates, almost everyone will tell you they've had at least a few bad experiences. So I've consolidated experiences of, you know, lots of people that I've interacted with and also my own experiences. And based on these experiences, I hope you'll make right decisions. So, when you first land at the university, most of you will be probably thinking about spending a few days at the university living with your seniors till you get time to find your own accommodation. But I'm going to tell you actual experiences that people have had in just like a week or two weeks, really bad experiences while living with their seniors, you know, before they could find apartments of their own. So when students from India are coming abroad for the first time, usually they're very calculative about every dollar and every rupee and you know their you know finances are usually the most important thing and they're really worried about spending money so uh, one of my friends he went to New York to a university and um, he was doing his masters and he, he was uh, you know the, most universities have an Indian Students Association and they put him up in a senior house this guy was also an Indian and um, he was living there for a few days and he had just landed there the previous day and the very next day the senior you know they were all having you know drinks and enjoying and suddenly he says hey you know what I kept three hundred dollars here and you stole it and this guy's like no I didn't take it and the guy says where could it go it must have been you and he accused him of stealing three hundred dollars the poor guy is just landed there for the first time away from home and this guy he was like a local bully and he and his friends started threatening him. And this guy should have just walked out and called 911 and just left or something. But he got afraid and he paid him $300 and he was crying. He cried himself to sleep that night. He just landed there and the next day he had to pay $300 for no fault of his in his senior's house. And then he would lock all his suitcases and, you know, keep his stuff there and hide from the senior. And he was trying to find an apartment of his own. And then when he found something, he... Uh, immediately moved out and the senior he ruined his reputation and made sure he would not get funding 
from any source in the university. He was like, he'd been there for a few years and he knew all the professors and he knew all the other students and stuff and he ruined his reputation and nobody else was willing to be a roommate for this guy. He found it so difficult to convince people that he wasn't, that he hadn't done anything wrong. And the senior made sure that this guy would not get a job in the cafeteria, would not get a funding. He really ruined his, you know, time at the university. So this is an actual experience that has happened to someone. So I'm going to try and tell you how to prevent such things from happening. And try and have minimal roommates always. So if I were in the university, even if I had a two-bed, two-bath apartment or if I had a big apartment, I would not accommodate people coming in because it's such a big risk. I mean, sometimes they come, they stay for a few days, you know, they just keep their things there and, you know, stay for a week or two weeks and then they find their own apartments and they just move away. And there's absolutely no problem. But in just this one or two weeks, there can be a hell lot of problems. And I'm going to tell you some things, some experiences that I myself have had. So, there was one time in Michigan when I was a master's student, I was sharing a one-bed, one-bath apartment with a Bengali guy. You know, uh, it was a little awkward and uncomfortable for me to share the bathroom and to share the apartment with a guy. I mean, he was a stranger, he was a PhD student. And, you know, just to save rent. It didn't even cost much rent in those days, but, you know, just to save rent. It was a one-bed, one-bath apartment, so I took the living room and I gave him the bedroom. And I was sharing the apartment with this guy. And one day, it was summer, and I was working on a summer job, I think at the cafeteria or something, and then I come home, and what do I see? This guy has brought home another guy. So he was a Bengali guy, and apparently there was another Bengali guy coming over, and without even taking my permission, he's brought home the other guy. And the other guy has already settled at home and kept all his suitcases stuffed there, taken a shower and changed into his pajamas, and I go home and see, who's this other guy? And this guy is like, oh, can he stay here for a few days? That put me in a really awkward spot. I didn't know what to say. Well, if I had my life to live over again, I would say, no, please go share with some other guys. Sorry, I can't let you stay here. Bye. I would ask him to leave. And I would also probably ask this guy also to leave, you know, for bringing home someone without my permission. But apparently I hadn't told my roommate not to bring anyone home. I mean... A guy should have some basic common sense, right? It was uncomfortable enough for a girl to share the bathroom with one guy. And without my permission, he brought home another guy. And this guy was such a jerk, okay? You won't believe how, many, how much problems he caused for me in just like the two weeks he lived in my place. So I would like to tell you about that. So this guy, his name was Nikhil, and he's like, you know... He comes home and, okay, I thought he would stay for a few days and find his accommodation and go away. So first of all, like, I'm a strict vegetarian and I keep my utensils separate. I don't let anyone cook non-vegetarian food in my utensils. It's just kind of a religious belief. It's just my lifestyle. So this guy comes and my Bengali roommate used to have um, chicken and fish and all this stuff in the freezer. So this guy wants to make uh, chicken patties and burgers, whatever, and he uses my utensils for it. And I was ready to blow my top. It made me really mad. So I had to tell him not to use my utensils to cook meat. So that was one thing. And then there was one time I was in the restroom and this guy's like howling outside saying, you know what, I, I got to rush to the toilet, I got to rush, I got to rush, whatever. So I was in the shower and I had to come out in my towel and let this guy in. Who needs this headache, okay? He could have gone and shared accommodation with some other guys. I didn't have to accommodate him. So I had to come out and wait and let this guy in. Big headache. I didn't like it. And then there's one time I came home from my summer job or from my research. And I, what do I see? This guy who was a visitor in my apartment. He was sleeping in my bed in the living room. Don't parents teach their sons these basic manners, I mean. You can't go to somebody's house and sleep in a woman's bed without her permission. I mean, that's a very personal space. This guy is happily, you know, with my computer and my pillow. He's sleeping in my bed. I was ready to blow my top. But I just controlled myself and, well, I just politely asked him to get off my bed or something. 
And then he did a lot of other things too. So basically he was not even looking for another accommodation. He was happily staying in my place. And then he started cracking dirty jokes and touching me all over. You know, it is a kind of sexual abuse, right? I mean, started touching me all over and cracking dirty jokes. And I wanted to throw him out of the house. I wanted to call 911, but I didn't have the confidence. I must have been really young, like maybe 22 years old. I mean, I was myself new in the United States. And I didn't have the confidence to, like, throw him out. And if I asked him to get out, he would not get out. He was so shameless. And if you call 911, it becomes like a topic of, you know, real big gossip in the university. People start gossiping about you and things like that. So I was stuck and then I asked my roommate who brought this guy without my permission to ask this guy to get out. So, uh, and after a few days, he was asked to leave. And in the meantime, this guy went and registered at the university with my address. So, you know, in Western countries, like in the United States, for example, they're very strict about how many people can live in an apartment. So in a one bed, one bath apartment, you can only have two people living at any time. And in a two bedroom apartment, you can have maximum five people living. And anything more than that, they can fine you heavily. So this stupid Tempaco, this guy, went and registered at the university with my address. So then the next thing I know, the next day, I get a notice from the university and the leasing office saying, you've had three people living in this apartment, so you have to pay a fine of $500. I'm like, hell no, I never wanted this guy in my house. He was a tempaco and he just stayed for like two weeks. And I had to go and prove it to the university or else I would end up paying $500. So he created this many problems for me. And after all that I did for him, he was going around bad mouthing me and spreading gossip about me and telling everyone what a bad person I was. So this was such a bad experience. I'm just saying, you have to be very careful about whom you allow into your apartment. So many people are going to land abroad for the first time and they think they can live with their seniors for a week or two and find accommodation of their own. But in this week or two, you can have all these problems. Even if you're offering accommodation to someone or if somebody else, or if you're staying in your senior's house. I mean, don't get me wrong. There have been many times when I've lived with my seniors. I've let people stay in my apartment without having any problems whatsoever. But I'm saying people have had really bad experiences and... If it can happen to them, it can happen to you too. So first of all, if you're a girl and you don't feel comfortable sharing an apartment with a guy, you have every right, every reason to tell him, sorry, I don't feel comfortable sharing with a guy. Sorry, please go share with some other guys. It's perfectly okay. You can say that politely and save yourself a lifetime of trouble. It's happened to a lot of girls that I know, actually. I mean, sometimes like the Indian Students Association forces them to host a guy for a few days or something like that and and then they have really bad experiences of these guys misbehaving with them and then they can't tell anyone and they feel uncomfortable sharing their experiences with anyone and they suffer and they've had all kinds of problems. If you're a girl, you don't have to take the chance of you know letting a guy into your house without knowing who he is. Who knows what kind of a person he is. I mean, he's not going to have it written on his face that he's a thief or a sexual pervert or a cheap guy. I mean, they all look the same. So, if you're a girl, you don't have to take this chance. He can, if, if a guy is coming to the university for the first time, he can share with some of the guys. And even if you're sharing with some other girls, I mean, you don't have to feel obligated. I mean, it's okay if you want to do it, but be prepared for all the risks and problems that it brings. And if you're providing temporary accommodation to someone, please let them know that they cannot register at the university with your address. They have to wait till they find an apartment of their own and then go. Or if you are getting a tempaco into your apartment, let them know right at the beginning that they can stay only for three days and in the meantime they have to find something and leave or something like that. So, I'm going to tell you a variety of experiences that people have had. Based on my experiences with almost 35 different roommates, I think that broad-mindedness and adjusting nature are like the most important criteria in finding a good roommate. Earlier, I was very particular that I had vegetarian roommates and I would pick vegetarian roommates because I thought we could 
you know, solve a lot of problems that way. But I've had a lot of roommates who were meat eaters, who were sometimes drinkers, who were really nice people. And I think that's the most important thing. It's important for frequencies to match and for people to adjust and live with each other, to be friendly and nice and cooperative. That's the most important thing. Even if your food habits are different, and even if you know you, you don't drink another person drinks, and even if your sexual habits are different, what's most important is whether the person is broad-minded and adjusting or not. That's more important than anything else. So, when I first went to the United States, I lived with a Bengali girl, and she would cook chicken and fish a lot, and I was like strict vegetarian, and uh, it made me very uncomfortable. But then, we got along quite well. We had ups and downs, but we got along quite well. After living with all these roommates, if I were to get a roommate, I would first look at the personality and how broad-minded and adjusting the person is. It might seem like the person is really nice, but when you start living together, you'll unearth a lot of aspects of the person's personality. So, there was one time in Arizona, like, I lived in a two-bed, two-bath apartment, and the way it worked at that leasing office was that the other bedroom and bathroom could be allocated to any lady, any female of their choice, and I had no control over it. So they allotted a Russian lady to be my roommate. So uh, it was a little difficult in some ways. I mean, considering that I was a strict vegetarian, so this lady, first of all, she didn't know a word of English. I mean, she knew very little English, and we had to use the laptop translator to communicate with each other. So I would type in English, and she would translate into Russian, and she would type in Russian, and translate in English to me. But we got along really well. So this lady, she would, you know, fill up the f freezer with beef and pork and fish and eggs and, you know, all kinds of red meat and white meat. And it was, like, full of meat. And I found that a little uncomfortable being a vegetarian. So, uh, you know, I was a first-year MBA student, and it was so hectic. I mean, we would be in the lab till 1 o'clock in the morning, past midnight, and then again I had to be in the lab at 7 in the morning. So it was all about teamwork, and it was really hectic, and I hardly had time to cook. So I would get a lot of frozen food and put it in the freezer, like frozen idlis and frozen dosas and frozen stuff, because I didn't have time to cook. And she would have all this beef and pork and all this stuff, and I had to pick my food and heat it in the microwave and eat it. It was uncomfortable, but we had a jolly good relationship. She would try and tell me so much about her culture and learn about my culture, and we would um, do our shopping together sometimes. And we got along really well. And after a couple of months, she went off to Russia, and even then, she tried to keep in touch with me. I mean, we got along really well without a single fight. And that's the most important thing. You need to have a good working relationship with living relationship with roommates. You don't have to become best friends, but it's important to have like peace of mind in the apartment. So, and I've had roommates who were vegetarian with whom I thought I could get along really well, who turned out to be such narrow-minded jerks. So I'm going to tell you about that as well. So, a lot of people, if you talk to them, they tell you about narrow-minded roommates. And one thing I've learned in all these years is that if a person is narrow-minded, he's going to be narrow-minded for the rest of his life. And there's very little you can do to change that. So there was one time in New York, I lived with some roommate, and she wouldn't let me sit on her couch because she had paid for the couch. It was not a furnished apartment. She had furnished it. And I sat on the couch to watch TV, and she's like, hey, I paid for this couch. Why are you sitting on my couch? So that's the way some roommates can be. And they pick fights, like, every day about, for, you know, for practically no reason. So... There was one time in my university, there were two PhD students, both girls, and they were fighting about one girl using hot water to do the dishes. And the other girl was like, it costs 10 cents more, so you got to use cold water to wash the dishes. And they were both PhD students. I mean, you would expect some level of maturity from a PhD student, right? 
but this was an actual fight that I've seen. So there, there are also two other girls whom I knew who were fighting. These are all grad and graduate students and PhD students, okay? Fighting over a pack of potato chips. So one girl is like, we bought these potato chips, we shared and bought this pack of potato chips. I ate eight pieces, you ate 12 pieces. So you got to pay more. Two cents more or five cents more or ten cents more. Can you believe it? But these are actual fights that people have had. Another roommate of, I mean, a friend of mine, he, you know, all kinds of fights can happen between roommates. So the one guy had washed all his plates and dishes and left them by the sink. And this guy used his plate to have his food. And the other guy picked a major fight with him saying, hey, I just did my dishes. Why are you using my plate? Come on, he would wash it after eating. But then there was a big fight about that. So there was one time in California, I had a really narrow-minded roommate. She was working in Intel, making a lot of money. She picked a major fight with me. You know, we were like three girls living in an apartment. And she says, the other girl paid for the shoe rack and you're keeping five pairs of slippers on it. Can you believe it? Is that something to fight about? That too, she didn't pay for it. She says, the other girl paid for it. You're keeping five pairs of slippers and she's fighting. I was too disgusted to even reply. That was my first time in California and I had two vegetarian roommates and, you know, we met on Suleika.com and I was really happy that they were both vegetarian. But they turned out to be such disgusting, narrow-minded people. So to that roommate of mine, if you're watching this video, shame on you. So, and there was another roommate, I mean, of these two roommates. The other one was talking to me so rudely. She was like a cleanliness freak. And just because there was a couple of strands of hair lying in the bathroom floor, she was like, if you understand English, your hairs are lying on the floor. She didn't even know that the plural of hair is hair, not hairs. And, you know, I had a 760 and 800 GMAT. And my roommate would talk to me so rudely. If you understand English, you know, that's the way she would talk. You know, sometimes... Some people might get angry, you know, when there's a fight between roommates, they might just call 911 and throw the other person out. It has happened too. But I have my own ethics. I couldn't do that to anyone. So, I'm going to tell you some more experiences I've had with roommates. And then you'll realize that it's not going to be a jolly good ride with roommates. So, there was one time in Irvine. I, there were two girls who were both working for Infosys. They had come on site. And I moved in with them as the third roommate. It was a one bed, one bath apartment. And they were narrow minded. So these two girls, they didn't have a car. And I used to have a used car in those days. And so I thought, at least God gave me a car. Let me try and help these people who don't have a car. So I would take them grocery shopping and stuff and help them bring their groceries home. Otherwise, you know, if you take a cab, it costs like. $25 each way each time so I would help them do their groceries and stuff there was one time they gave me a big list of items to bring from the Indian grocery store so I got them all these vegetables and milk and everything and our house was on the upper floor they wouldn't even come down to carry it upstairs I carried the whole thing and gave it to them I was not obligated to but I just felt like you know helping someone in need so I gave them the groceries and then Guess what they said? So one girl picks a fight with me saying, Hey, I asked you to bring this particular brand of milk. Why did you bring this milk? I asked you to bring Altadena brand, brand of milk. I'm like, hey, this is what I brought. And she's like, oh, okay. Okay, you know, she's fighting with me about that. And the other girl was like, we asked you to bring cilantro. Who asked you to bring organic cilantro? That costs 10 cents more. So cilantro is coriander. You know, it's called cilantro in the U.S. So, it costs 10 cents more. Who asked you to bring organic cilantro? First of all, I'm not obliged to bring their groceries for them. I'm not obliged to carry it upstairs and deliver it to them. I do all this free of cost, trying to help them. And they pick fight with me, saying, why did you bring organic cilantro instead of regular cilantro? Can you believe it? Well, that was the last time I helped them, so... Next time they asked me for groceries, I said, go do it yourself. So, 
This is the kind of rumors there are in the world. This is the kind of people there are in the world. So, I'm going to tell you some more crazy experiences that people have had. There was one time in New Hampshire, I was working for a consultancy and, you know, we, had, we were put up in the guest house and there was one girl who was also a master's student who was on internship. She locked herself in the bathroom and she was like crying and crying loudly for like two hours. She would not come out. Apparently she had just broken up with her boyfriend and the guy had dumped her and moved on or something like that. And she was crying, crying like crazy and, you know, talking on the phone with someone and it was so scary. We were afraid that she might commit suicide there or something and then the police would come and question us. We were trying to ask her to come out of the bathroom and she would not come out. She was sitting there for two hours and, and we were getting afraid. So this is another experience I've had. And if you have roommates, tell them right in the beginning that they can't bring anyone home without your permission. They can't bring anyone home after 10 p.m. So you have to let these rules, you know, lay out these rules well in advance. So, when I was a grad student, I, my roommate was from the physics department, she was a PhD student, and she would bring home some, you know, Russian classmates who would come home at like 2 o'clock in the morning, fully drunk with vodka. I would be sleeping there in the living room and they would come fully drunk and talking loudly, discussing something and disturbing me at 2 o'clock in the morning. So, you have to tell roommates that these things are not going to work. You have to put your foot down on these things. So, some roommates, you know, they have fights due to mismatch and cleanliness. I had a roommate in LA who was like a cleanliness freak. She had this OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. So, I might have eaten a cookie or something and I just wiped my hand on my pants and she gave me a big 15 minute lecture on cleanliness saying if you drop these crumbs here we're going to attract insects and you know I mean how dirty can it be and how many insects are going to come just from that if there was like one you know grain of rice lying around or if there's one drop of water lying around or you know some foods little bit of food spilled while cooking, she would create such a fuss and such a ruckus. Oh, made my life kind of miserable. I mean, let me give you this bit of advice. If you had to choose between a clean roommate and a dirty roommate, depending on the kind of person you are, most people are like average in cleanliness, right? Like on a scale of 10, most people are between 5 and 7, I would say, or 4 and 7. So, if you had to choose between someone who was like 10 on 10 in cleanliness, who wants everything perfectly squeaky clean and who's going to, you know, keep nitpicking all the time saying, don't do this, don't do that, that's not clean, that's not clean. And if you had to pick between like a cleanliness freak and someone who is on the dirtier side, meaning who doesn't really keep the bathroom and kitchen very clean and um, who leaves dishes in the sink, things like that, I would probably pick the dirty one. Because if a person is like dirty, you can clean up after them. But if a person is a cleanliness freak and they have this OCD and they, they're going to be picking fault with you all the time, it's going to ruin your peace of mind and you can't perform at work or in the university. It's going to really affect your peace of mind. So between like a super clean and slightly dirty roommate, I would rather pick the dirty one. I would give myself about 7 or 8 points on 10 for cleanliness. Try to keep myself fairly clean, but I'm not obsessed with cleanliness, you know, it's, it's, I don't have this OCD. So, first of all, try and assess what kind of a person you are. If you're a cleanliness freak, you might want to live with someone who's also like equally a cleanliness freak. If you're a dirty person, you might be better off with someone who is average or, you know, on the dirtier side. Otherwise, there's going to be a lot of problems. It's considering that most people are between 4 and 7 on a scale of 10 on cleanliness, you know, try and assess what kind of the person your roommate is. Is she, you know, she or is he or she a cleanliness freak? Is he really dirty? You know, try and assess it for a while before you get them to sign the lease and be your roommate. So I'm going to tell you some more crazy experiences that people have had. I had a friend. She said she lived in a 
two bed, two bath apartment in New Jersey and there were five girls living there. And so the fifth girl who was living in the living room, apparently she was sharing the bathroom with, you know, uh, both the rooms. So sometimes she would use this bathroom and sometimes the other bathroom. So she had some kind of a psychiatric disorder or something like that. And she would not flush the toilet. First they told her politely, then they told her rudely. She would not. Either it was a psychiatric disorder or she was probably, you know, doing it deliberately to annoy them. I don't know. But she would not flush. That's one hell of a problem to have, right? And then they asked her to quit, I believe, but then she was on the lease. Once a person is on the lease, if they don't want to quit, you can't make them quit. So finally, so they, I think they somehow convinced her to quit and then she stole my friend's very expensive watch and left. That happens a lot too. Roommates can steal your things. I know it's cheap, it's disgusting, but it happens a lot. So, where do people usually find roommates? Usually they find roommates on Suleka.com. Indians, I'm saying, in the US or a lot of countries, Suleka.com is usually where people find roommates. And Craigslist ads are not always safe. So, there was, you know, one time in um, LA, Irvine, in that area, I was looking for accommodation and if somebody is offering a room for rent at a much lower price than the market price, be sure there's a cat somewhere. So I found this ad on Craigslist where this um, American girl was uh, offering a room and bathroom in her big house. She, I think she had a three bedroom house or something. And she was offering a room and a bathroom for just like $350 a month or something. That's like way below the market price. Anybody else would charge like $800, $900 a month. So it seemed really strange. And then I spoke to her a couple of times, exchanged a couple of emails. And then after talking to her a couple of times, we she asked me to go over and meet her. But before that, we were just talking and I asked her why she's offering it so cheap. And she said, you know, I'm a lesbian. I hope you don't have a problem with that. I'm looking for like a partner. Ah, well, I do have a problem with that. I'm not a lesbian then. Well, I, I couldn't take up that accommodation. So if someone is offering a room at a much lower price, there will be a cat somewhere. Watch out for that. There was another time in LA, around the same time, I found another advertisement and a couple was offering a room and a bathroom in their house for uh, about $500 a month, whereas the market rate was about $800 to $900 a month. And, um, and after I exchanged a couple of emails with them, they wrote to me saying, you know, we're a nudist couple. I hope you don't have a problem with that. Actually, I do have a big problem with that. I don't want to see nude people in the house every day. So, if there is a room being offered at a lower price, be sure there's a catch. And then, nip bad habits in the bud. So with roommates, friends, if there's something you don't like, say it and be done with it, okay? Don't let them ruin your peace of mind. For anybody, your peace of mind is the most important thing in your life. Don't let anyone ruin your peace of mind. If somebody is affecting your peace of mind, whether it's a friend or a relative, just think, is my peace of mind more important or is this relationship more important? Tell the person, you are ruining my peace of mind. Please stop this behavior. And if they truly care about you, they would stop the behavior. Tell them a second time. If not, end it. Believe me, end it. Nothing is more important to you than your peace of mind. So... If you suspect that a person lacks integrity, better cut them off sooner than later. Don't wait for something bad to happen. One of my friends, uh, she had a roommate who was copying her assignments without her knowledge. So she had this desktop and the roommate was using it, I guess, and she was somehow getting access to her emails or something or her 
uh, hard disk and she was copying her assignments and submitting it at the university. They were both classmates too, and roommates. And then the lecturer sees both of them submitted the same assignment. And then this roommate had to tell the lecturer that the other girl had copied it. And guess what the other girl says? No, I worked on the assignment, she copied it. So then this girl had to fight with the roommate and then break away and go live separately. So there's one time in Arizona, I had a really shameless classmate who would come to my house like every single day, you know, like, got something to eat, got something to eat. The moment she stepped in the door, that was the first thing she would say. She was always using up my groceries, eating up my food. Sometimes we would cook together, it was fun. But if you bring your, if she brought her groceries and we shared and cooked together, it would be fun. It's not fun when somebody exploits you. So she kept taking my food, I dropped hints, she would not catch it. I had to be rude to her and tell her that, you know, I'm not going to feed her anymore. So if there's something you don't like, if you can't tell them in person, send them an email. Think, okay? Is my peace of mind more important? Is my money more important? Or this friendship is more important? If somebody is exploiting you, tell them to stop. And if they truly cared about you, they would stop. Or else end the relationship. No relationship is more important than your peace of mind, okay? And it's the same with dating and relationships. If you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and there's something you don't like, have an open conversation and tell them about it. If they truly cared about you, they would change their behavior. Or else end it. There's plenty of fish as they say. So I'm going to give you some advice about how to pick a good roommate. Based on all these crazy experiences that people have had, I think it would be good to form some generic guidelines about how to pick a good roommate. So talk to the person for at least 20 minutes before you agree to, you know, let them be your roommate. Sometimes people exchange emails, somebody's already got an apartment and somebody's coming from India. They say, okay, you can move in with me. Don't do that. Talk to the person. These days we have WhatsApp calls, Skype calls, emails, exchange emails. Talk for at least 20 minutes. Try and assess what kind of a person the other person is. Try to assess their personality. What kind of families they come from. How broad-minded they seem to be. Whether they are financially stable. You don't want to get stuck with someone who has no money, who's going to be like begging you for money all the time or potentially even stealing your things and stealing your money. You don't want to get stuck with that kind of a person. You are not responsible for their financial problems. You don't want to get stuck with people who are going to you know, be begging you for money all the time. And if you try and assess a person in about 20 minutes, you'll see how broad-minded they are. You'll get some rough idea, basically. Always ask them about why they left their previous roommates. Ask them about their previous roommate experiences, if they've lived with roommates before. Ask them what kind of roommates they had previously. And if they tell you a lot of bad things and they keep complaining, well, it could potentially reflect on their own personality. They may not be very easy to get along with. So, this is an important thing. Like, there was one time, like, I was looking for accommodation in L.A. And there was this Indian couple. They were a vegetarian couple. They, were, they had a two-bed, two-bath apartment and they were letting out a room and a bathroom. So I went there and I was talking to them and they seemed nice, but I asked them who was living in that room before me. And they said they were, they had let, let out the room to some Indian guy who didn't keep the bathroom very clean. And so they had really nasty fights and then they had to ask him to leave and there was a big mess. I was like, oh, well, it's possible that the other guy was not very clean, but it's also possible that these people are nitpickers or they're, you know, fastidious and very hard to please and maybe they, they're going to be picking fault with everything you do. Hmm. So the other thing was I was talking to this couple and the woman said she was going to India for the summer for like three or four months. And so I would be alone in that house with her husband. Who knows what kind of a person he is. I mean, with a girl living with a guy, there's always chances of, you know, the guy misbehaving with you. Is it, do you really want to take that risk? And then I was looking around the apartment and in the kitchen there was this shelf, I mean, this whole big shelf full of alcohol. Like, really strong alcohol, like rum and whiskey and, you know, vodka and that kind of stuff. 
So I'm going to be alone with her husband for like four months and he's a big drinker. Do I really want to be in that situation? I said, no. I don't want to take that risk. And then I moved in with two other girls. So, most of you might have watched The Big Bang Theory, the TV show. You don't want a roommate like Sheldon. I mean, however intelligent and clean he might be. He's going to be like crazy and picking fault with everything you do and driving you nuts. You don't want to get stuck with someone like Leonard who brings girls to sleep over and they make all these noises in the night and affect your sleep. You don't want that either. You don't want someone like Penny who has no money and who is really dirty and who distracts your concentration, who has no money to pay her bills. You don't want that kind of a roommate either. So, types of roommates to avoid. You don't want to get stuck with a complainer who's going to be picking fault with everything you do and complaining about everything and everyone in the world. It can really demoralize you and affect your performance. You don't want to get stuck with a chatterbox who's going to be like talking on the phone like four hours every day and, you know, talking about everything, spreading gossip and, you know, affecting your peace of mind. So I, I once had this problem, I mean, in, in California. So one of my roommates was a preschool teacher and she would be talking on the phone like for four hours every day with her boyfriend. We were sharing one room, okay, so she would be sitting like right in front of me talking all the time. I would tell her to go to the living room and she wouldn't. And, you know, somehow, sometimes she would, sometimes she wouldn't. And I, would, I was applying, you know, those days, I mean, a few years back, I was applying for a PhD and filling out applications. I needed to write my statements of purpose and I needed to concentrate and focus. And my stupid roommate was like annoying me, talking on this phone, the same old stupid stuff, four hours a day. So you don't want to get stuck with that kind of a roommate. You don't want to get stuck with gossip mongers who are going to be talking about your personal life and about your habits to everyone in the university or other people. You don't want to get stuck with a thief. Some people have this habit of stealing. Even if they come from well-to-do families, I've seen this happen. Especially if they come abroad for the first time. They kind of, kind of like save every dollar, save every penny. So they steal your food, they steal your belongings from your suitcase, they can steal your clothes, steal your laptop, they can do anything. You don't want to get stuck with a thief but you don't realize it till you move in with them. You don't want to get stuck with a narrow-minded person. A lot of people in the world, unfortunately, are narrow-minded. So, they can be narrow-minded in many ways. They pick fault for the silliest things and, you know, behave like they're perfect and you're totally imperfect or something. You don't want to get stuck with messy people, I mean, you don't want to get stuck with a drug addict. You don't want to stuck with someone who's really dirty, who's not doing the dishes. Some people, you know, they come from really rich families in India or Sri Lanka. My uncle had a Sri Lankan roommate who was, who would not even do the dishes. He came from a really rich family who had four servants at home and stuff. He would eat all the food and dump all the dishes in the sink and there was no place to even wash your hands. He was so dirty. So they had to make him do the dishes. And, you know, he would take my uncle's food and also pack the rest of it and take it with him to the university and stuff. And, you know, you, you don't want to get stuck with someone whose food habits don't match with your own. That's also kind of messy in a way. Like my uncle, who was a PhD student at Yale many years ago, he was living in some kind of a dormitory accommodation which had a lot of Koreans and... Uh, East Asians, like Vietnamese people and Chinese and all these people. And they would bring all these, you know, insects to cook and eat. They would bring, I don't even know what they're called, these insects and break off their legs and boil them. And my uncle, being a vegetarian, found it really disgusting. They would boil all these insects and lobsters, you know, all these kind of insects and, you know, creatures. And it was food for them. What is food for one person can be poison for another person. So... And they would eat and leave all the leftovers in the fridge. So, that kind of grooming. And then, 
You don't want to get stuck with a cleanliness freak who's going to pick fault with everything you do. Sometimes you think it's going to work out really well, but just because you have a couple of strands of hair lying in the bathroom or just because uh, you spilled some juice or just because you, you know, dropped some rice on the floor, they're going to create havoc. You don't want to get stuck with such kind of a cleanliness freak. You don't want to get stuck with a psycho. Some people are outright psychos, okay? I'm going to tell you shortly about one experience I had with a complete psycho roommate who accused me of stealing toilet paper and turned the cops on me at 10.30 in the night. So I'm going to tell you about that. You don't want to get stuck with a sexual pervert who's going to be trying to grope you and touch you all over and crack dirty jokes. You don't want to get stuck with that kind of a person. You don't want to get stuck with a cranky person who's going to throw tantrums for no reason and all this stuff. Factors that make a good roommate. Broad-mindedness and addressing nature are the most important. Sometimes poor people who are not well-educated or clean, they may be very nice, very adjusting, and you may have a jolly good time together. Sometimes there are highly educated, rich people from, you know, very well-to-do families, supposedly cultured families, who are so cheap and narrow-minded. Like, for example, this girl, Saumya, who was my roommate in California. She picked such a big fight with me for keeping five pairs of slippers on a shoe rack that the other girl had paid for. She did not even pay for it. Shame on you if you're watching this, I mean. And then, there's not much correlation between wealth, education, and broad-mindedness. And don't assume that just because a person has a degree from an Ivy League university or he's rich, that he is very kind, compassionate, or adjusting. These are two different things altogether. Now, if you are going to a very reputed university, for example, you got admission at MIT, or Purdue University, or Rice, or Stanford University, and suppose there's a person who has just arrived to the same university, and suppose the Indian Students Association asks you to accommodate this person for a couple of weeks. Don't assume that just because he got admission into this top-notch university that he's a good person, he or she. The fact that he got admission to this university just means that he's academically brilliant. He has good grades. That's all that it means. He might be sexually perverted. He might be narrow-minded. He might be a thief. He might be a psycho. He might be a really, really disgusting person. So you can't make assumptions about a person's personality just because he has good grades and a fantastic academic record just because he got admission in a university. I'm telling you, I've had such bad experiences. So lifestyle compatibility. So between roommates, make sure you have compatibility in these issues. So smoking, drinking, veg or non-veg food habits, Cleanliness, talking loud on the phone, religious preferences, sexual habits. So, if these parameters match up, it's good for you. But more than all these parameters, what's important is whether the person is adjusting and broad-minded or not. Sometimes, suppose you're a non-smoker and the other person is a smoker. If he's smoking outside the house and, you know, chewing mint so it's not sticking in the house, you might still be able to get along very well compared to another person who's also a non-smoker but who's narrow-minded. If they're narrow-minded, they're narrow-minded and they will be narrow-minded. You can't do anything about that. I've gone out of my way and been nice to people trying to make them broad-minded, trying to change their mentality but it doesn't work. So there was one time, you know, like in Irvine, I was looking for accommodation and I met these two really nice girls. They were sharing an apartment. It was a one bed, one bath apartment and they were looking for a third roommate because their roommate had moved out. So we talked and I realized they were really friendly, really sweet, really nice, but our lifestyles were so different. We could be friends, but we couldn't hit it off as roommates. Like for example, food habits. I'm a very strict vegetarian. I'd far rather die than eat meat. But, and I don't let anyone use my utensils to cook meat. I feel somewhat uncomfortable when I see meat. So, 
but they were both non vegetarians and they cooked meat at least three to four times a week. And they also cooked a lot of red meat. So, first of all, our food habits were different. And then drinks and sleepovers. You know, the kind of lifestyle I adopt is like, you know, I consciously choose to be very spiritual and religious and do a lot of meditation and yoga and that kind of stuff. I wake up in the morning and have my prayers on my computer and yeah, do my yoga, meditation and, you know, that's the kind of lifestyle that I lead. And these people have, they had guys coming over for sleepovers and they would do things and they would have drinks together and wake up with a hangover, throw up all over the place and, you know, that's the kind of lifestyle they led. It's not about right or wrong, but I'm saying we were incompatible in that. I do, I did have a problem with, you know, random strange guys coming over and getting drunk and, you know, doing things in the apartment. I had a problem with that. So, so religious habits. I mean, I'm kind of deeply religious and spiritual, but they were totally irreligious and, you know, reckless in their mentality. Cleanliness. I'm fairly clean, but they had stuff strewn all over the place. So then we mutually decided we could be friends, but we couldn't hit it off as romance. They were really nice, very adjusting, broad-minded girls. Very nice people. And we can be friends, but we couldn't hit it off as roommates because of incompatibility in lifestyle. So, friends versus roommates. Not all roommates are friends. And not all friends are roommates. So, you, you can't, not all friends can hit it off as roommates. So suppose you have a best friend and you meet and talk and, you know, you live in your, in, you know, independent houses and you're best friends. But if you live together as roommates, the friendship may not last. You may never be able to hit, hit it off as roommates. Maybe because you're very clean and the other person doesn't care about cleanliness. Maybe you don't like, you know, TV being loud and the other person watches TV late night. Maybe you're very religious and the other person wants, you're vegetarian and the other person wants to cook meat. You can be best friends, but you could probably never hit it off as roommates. And with roommates, if you have a decent living relationship, that's more than enough. As long as you have peace at home and you don't have fights, a decent working living relationship, that's more than enough. Don't expect roommates, all roommates to become best friends. Some of them can be real great enemies, actually. And then don't expect roommates to take care of you when you're sick. Don't expect roommates to do favors for you. If they don't steal your stuff, if they don't ruin your peace of mind, and if they don't mess up your apartment, if they don't steal your food, I mean, if they're decent human beings, that's more than enough. Don't expect anything more than that from romance. So, you need a broad-minded, peaceful, honest, responsible, clean person as a roommate. Even if they can't be your best friend, it's important to have a good living relationship. That's all you need. And if you suspect any of your classmates at the university of not having academic integrity, if you think they're the kind of people who would cheat or something, stay away from them. For God's sake, don't make them your roommates. So, you know, sometimes roommates keep in touch for so many years, decades after they part ways, and they think of all the good times they shared. But sometimes they only think of the fights they had. So, guys and girls sharing apartments. So, a lot of boys and girls think it's cool, it's something to experiment with, boys and girls sharing apartments, but it can lead to a lot of complications and problems. Let me tell you actual experiences that people have had, and you can form your conclusions based on that. So, uh, there was one guy at a university, a grad student or a PhD student, and he saw this new grad student, a girl who had come to the university, and he, he took her to be his roommate in his apartment. And this girl, and this guy had, you know, dreams in his eyes and starry eyes. He was like, who knows, um, he might fall in love with a girl and the girl might fall in love with him and they might get married and live happily ever after and with all these bright dreams in his eyes. He took this girl to be his roommate. But the girl moved in and she didn't like this guy. She had absolutely no inclination towards him. And so 
but she liked the apartment very much. So one day after some minor argument, she called 911. So once you're on the lease, both roommates are like equal. It doesn't mean that the apartment, anyone has more rights than the other. So this girl, she called the cops and she accused this guy of sexually harassing her. So the cops, they just want to prevent fights in the neighborhood. So at 10 o'clock in the night, they made this guy pick up his things and get out of his own apartment. So this is what that girl did. And then she took in one of her friends, another girl, as a roommate, and she lived there in that house. So that's one experience. And so there was another time. So there was this Indian girl who had an apartment at the university. And there was this Indian guy who, was, who had just arrived newly from India. And the Indian Students Association asked this girl to accommodate this guy for a week or two. So this girl kindly agreed. And it was like a one bed, one bath apartment. She let the guy use her bedroom and she, was, she had a bed in the living room and she was living in the bedroom, in the living room. And she let him sleep in the bedroom to make him comfortable. And then, uh, one day she came home from her lab or something and unlocked the door and went in and she heard some strange noises in the bedroom. And she went in there and what does she see? This guy who is newly arrived from India, he's hardly been in the US for a week, he's brought home a stripper from the strip club and they're having, they're doing stuff there in the bedroom in this girl's apartment. She was kind enough to host him for like one or two weeks and this is what the guy did. This girl was mad and then there was a lot of shrieking and shouting and yelling and then she called 911 and like threw him out and, and there were repercussions. The guy was trying to ruin her character and reputation and all this stuff. So get a roommate agreement in place before your roommate moves in. There have been all kinds of experiences. Like I had a friend in New York who was going to this university. He had seen this two bed, two bath apartment and it cost about $2,000 a month and he decided to take the apartment and he wanted two other guys to be roommates. And they had agreed. They were coming from India too. Two weeks after this guy had landed there and when they came there, so we were talking about how to find a good roommate and getting a roommate agreement in place before you get a roommate to move in. So many people think somebody's going to come from India and you know it's going to work out all fine and they just agree to become roommates even without meeting each other. Don't do that. Even if you are in a university or in, uh, in, in some city and you're trying to get a roommate, talk to that person for at least 20 minutes. Try to assess what kind of personality they have and, you know, and their habits and lifestyle and their previous experiences and think if it's really going to work out before you move in with a roommate. So, these are some rules for roommate agreements. Before you get a roommate, make sure you have an email. You put all these points in writing in an email and get your roommate to sign this agreement. So that would save you a lot of problems in future. So, the roommate will not bring any friend or relative to visit the apartment or stay overnight without your explicit prior permission. This is a very important point, otherwise you're going to end up in situations like I had this problem in Michigan. When I had this Bengali roommate and without my permission he brought home another guy. And that guy was such a jerk, he created so many problems. So, before you get a roommate in, make sure they agree to this point. They cannot bring home anybody to visit or to stay overnight without your prior permission. So that will, once you have this in writing in place, that will save you a lot of headache. In case of any dispute, or if you do not wish to continue having the other person as a roommate for any reason, the other person will vacate the apartment within a week after notification. So, you know, if 
two or more people, if they're all on the lease, they all have equal rights in the apartment. So remember, even if you are going into somebody else's house, and once you're on the lease, you both have equal rights, they cannot treat you as like a subordinate or like, you know, like a slave. You have equal rights. You can let them know. And if you have an apartment and you're taking in a roommate, if that person signs the lease, then you have equal rights. So you have to have an agreement in writing, in an email, in place with the roommate, which says, in case of a dispute, if there's any problem, the other person will vacate and not you. So if the other person calls the cops or, you know, all kinds of crazy things happen. Nobody expects crazy things to happen and that's why they happen. So if the other person creates some problems, you can just give a one week or two weeks notice and the other person has to vacate. You don't even have to give a reason sometimes. If you don't want them, you can always ask them to leave. But if you don't have this agreement in place, the other person may ask you to quit. So this can happen. And roommate will consult with you before reporting anything to the leasing office. So like there was this example of this of these two Indian girls and one girl brought bed bugs with her and went and told the leasing office that it was she who brought the bed bugs with her for the previous apartment and the, they charged her two thousand dollars to clean to fumigate the apartment so any such thing whether it's minor or major before reporting anything to the leasing office they're supposed to inform you if you get this in writing and explain it to them then that will save you a lot of problems. Rent and utilities payment must be made before the 5th of every month. Some roommates are really tardy and you know lazy and irresponsible. They don't pay till the end of the month, even though they're supposed to pay by the 5th of every month. So make sure they pay you before the 5th of every month. Get this in. Get this into their head and get this in writing in the agreement in an email. No smoking, drinking, Food options, uh, you know, details about sharing utensils, groceries, etc. as desired. So before you get a roommate in, sit them down and talk to them. Tell them, we're going to keep our groceries separate or we buy our groceries together and split the cars. Or you want to keep your utensils separate or the other person can use your utensils, it's okay. And if you're vegetarian, can the other person use your utensils to cook meat? Or is the other person allowed to bring non-vegetarian food into the house? And what is allowed, what's not allowed. I mean, you have to get these things in place before you get the roommate in. And no smoking or drinking. I mean, if you're a smoker and the other person's a smoker, it might be okay. But if you're not a smoker and if you don't want the other person to smoke, then you better not get a smoker at all. Because even if the other person smokes outside and comes home without, you know, chewing mint, it can still affect your peace of mind drastically. So... If you're a non-smoker, you better find a non-smoker. And, and you have to have clear rules about whether they can smoke or drink inside the apartment or not. And you will take turns to clean the restroom, kitchen, etc. every week or as per your specifications. So let them know how clean you are and how important cleanliness is to you. And tell them every alternate week, I mean, we take turns to clean the restroom and we take turns to, car, you know, vacuum the carpet and stuff. So, take turns to vacuum the apartment every week or as per your specifications. So, sometimes simple things like the restroom not being clean or the kitchen not being clean can cause major fights. So, they have to... Yeah, cleanliness is a good thing, actually, I mean. But overly doing anything is annoying. So, make sure you clean the stove and the restroom and, you know, uh, try to maintain a clean house. No talking on the phone after 10 p.m. It's important for you to get this into people's heads because I've had situations where, you know, I had this roommate who was a preschool teacher in California and she would be talking to her roommate, uh, to her boyfriend, for four hours every day, same old silly stuff. And we were sharing a room and I was applying for my PhD and, you know, I had to write my statements of purpose and I had to really focus and think and do it right. And she was, you know, annoying me the whole time. I would ask her to go to the living room, but sometimes she would be still sitting there and talking. I mean, so talking on the phone can be very 
uh, annoying for other people, so it can be disturbing. So you have to have all these rules laid out in place before you get a roommate into the apartment. Subleasing an apartment. It's never a good idea to sublease your apartment. Never, ever. So it's better to surrender your apartment and put your stuff in like a public storage or sell off your furniture. It's never a good idea to sublease your apartment. So subleasing means the lease is in your name, but you sublease the apartment to somebody else. And if that person damages your apartment or uh, doesn't pay the rent or so causes some problems, you will still be held liable for it. So, like, I, for example, they may crack the bathtub or cr cause scratches on the wall or damage the carpet or bring bed bugs, you will still be held liable for it. So it's never a good idea to sublease. Like the time when I was in Michigan, I subleased my apartment to this girl, Ruchi, my roommate. And I went on an internship and she dropped this huge, heavy pressure cooker in the middle of the carpet in the living room and damaged the carpet. And then she would not take accountability. She cheated me, basically. It cost me $550 to get the carpet in the living room replaced. I had to pay the leasing office, so... But uh, you get renter's insurance, like, you know, sometimes if you pay $10 a month or $20 a month, you get renter's insurance. And then whatever damage is caused, the insurance will take care of it. So if you have renter's insurance, it's slightly better. But assume you're subleased to someone and that person is running a meth lab, you know, in the apartment. Or suppose they're doing drugs. Or suppose uh, they cause some other problems and they get arrested or something. You'll still you know, in some way get into trouble. So it's never a good idea to sublease your apartment. Rent a hotel for a short sum stay. So if you're going to a city for just like a couple of months or just a few months for a project, you don't really have to sign the lease and take an apartment or even a studio or, you know, share with roommates and get into problems. Think about getting a room in Exterior State America. So Exchange Stay America is like a hotel which has a kitchenette in it and, you know, they clean your room every day so you get housekeeping and it's nice. And you can do your basic cooking and it probably costs a little more than a studio or, or an apartment but you'll have a lot of peace of mind and it's very comfortable. I know a lot of people, like for example, if sharing an apartment costs about $600 per month and Exchange Stay America might cost $800, $900 a month in some places. But it's still worth it. That's my point, if you can afford it. Even as a student, you know, in some places, like uh, two students, for example, they rent a room in Exchange Stay America and they live there for like a whole semester or for a whole year. They get housekeeping free. I mean, it's just a little more expensive than, a, than an apartment. And if they're sharing it between two people, it still works out fine. So living in Exchange Stay America is actually, or any such, you know, hotel, is actually a good idea and you can suppose you're landing at the university for the first time you might think it's okay to stay with your seniors for a couple of weeks and then find an apartment of your own but as I mentioned earlier that can cause tons and tons of problems sometimes so it might be wise to rent a low-cost hotel $30 a day $40 a day just for two days in about two days you can finalize your apartment rent a hotel put your stuff there so you don't have to depend on anybody else and then finalize your apartment and then, you know, that might be a wise thing to do. Be nice to your roommates. You just live together for like a few months, you know, sometimes for a few semesters. And you either have sweet memories or bitter memories. So when you're students, usually there's, you know, you're driven by deadlines and there's so much work to do. Even when you're a working professional, treat your roommates with respect. Be nice to them. When I had roommates, I went out of my way to be nice to them. Like when I had the lease in my name, like in Atlanta, I had this roommate who was coming from Infosys abroad for the first time. And her parents were really worried about her. And uh, I went to the airport and picked her up and I got her a comforter and I, I would drop her to the office every day and we would do everything together. And her father was so touched and he was so happy he was act he actually called me up to thank me and he was actually crying on the phone that he was so happy that I took good care of his daughter 
we just lived together for a few months. That was like 10 years ago in Atlanta. But then when we think about it, we carry such sweet memories. And sometimes roommates, it just didn't work out. And all we think about is like the fights we had. And, you know, sometimes I've gone out of my way to be nice to roommates and I got shit in return. But still, I'm proud to say that in my life, I never cheated anyone financially. And I tried to be nice to my roommates. I took a lot of shit from them. They cheated me of hundreds of dollars. I bought it, but I never turned the cops on anyone. I never threw them out of the house. I did. I could have, but I didn't. And I'm proud to say it. And uh, sometimes you can compromise a little on cleanliness and make sure you have peace between roommates. Like when I was in Arizona, my roommate, she was a young girl. She was also an MIS, she was an MIS student. And I taught her some basic cooking and Sometimes she was so busy in the lab and she would, you know, go off with her friends and she wouldn't do the dishes in many days and the dirty dishes would be lying in the sink. I don't like to see dirty dishes in the sink overnight. But there was one time she didn't do the dishes for more than 10 days or 12 days. And finally I told her and after like 10 days she finally did the dishes. It annoyed me that the dirty dishes were lying there for 10 days. But then I told her politely and we had a very good relationship and... In the end, you know, when I was leaving, when I graduated and I was leaving Arizona, they gave me um, so many gifts and she was so happy and things like that. When I think about the time I spent with this girl, we hardly lived together for two semesters in a summer. Those dirty dishes don't bother me now. That was like five years ago. But if we had fights and if we had a bad relationship, that would still linger on in memories. So either you have sweet memories or bitter memories. Those dirty dishes don't bother me but I'm glad we had a good relationship. Sometimes your roommates don't clean the apartment and it costs you hundreds of dollars. You lose your deposit and stuff. But that's always a risk. You have to take it. So, if you had to choose between having a nice, broad-minded roommate who will not pick fights with you, and in the end it costs you a couple of hundred dollars because that person didn't clean the apartment, I would still take the good roommate who's a broad-minded, quiet person. As opposed to having a really clean roommate and who will make sure you get back your entire deposit, but all you think about is the fights you had and you lost all your peace of mind and you don't want to see that person's face ever again in life. It's good to have a friendly, broad-minded roommate. Even if you lose $100, $200, it's okay. You can earn it later in life. It's good to have sweet memories and peace of mind more than anything else. So, even if your roommate is not a good person sometimes, be nice to them because... Remember, that person has parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, brothers and sisters back home who care about that person. For the sake of his or her parents and grandparents, be nice to them. Because if you are mean to them and you scold them or, you know, and if they go complain to their parents, their parents are going to worry. I know a lot of parents in India who worry so much about their sons and daughters and brothers. And I think if you have the lease in your name, be nice to your roommates, compromise, and you're just going to be together for a few months, be nice to each other. But at the same time, you don't have to let them exploit you. So think of your relationship with your roommates as a trial for your future relationships. If you're going to get married in future, you have to put up with your in-laws and your spouses. Think of this as a kind of a preparatory phase. This is like a trial relationship with your roommates. I mean, how you deal with them and how you put up with them can actually prepare you for future relationships. When you live with any human being, think about how can I help that person. Think about how you can enrich them instead of criticizing them and picking fault with them and making their life miserable. Forget about judging people. Just think about how you can enrich them. Paying guest accommodation. So there are a lot of these Gujarati families and also Punjabi families and Telugu families, a lot of families, Indian families and other Sri Lankan families, so many families in uh, US and other countries which offer PG accommodation for students, working professionals and even for couples. So usually they give you a room and a bathroom in, in their big house. So I lived as a paying guest in Irvine. 
with the Gujarati family for some time and by seven o'clock they would have dinner laid out on the table. I just had to pay like hundred dollars a month for dinner five days a week. So it was very convenient and they were really nice people. They would say, you know, take more rotis, take more rice, take whatever you want, you know, they were really nice. Usually they're nice and you also get food free, so. Uh, but, uh, I mean, uh, you can think about being a paying guest. It usually works out, but I've had cases where sometimes it doesn't work out. Either the paying guest is like really noisy and something happens and they ask her to leave or something. Or sometimes the families are not so nice. So it's always a risk and you have to just take the risk. But usually paying guest accommodation is nice. So think about marriage before coming abroad. This is just my bit of personal advice to you. Especially if you're like an Indian girl coming abroad for the first time. When I reflect on my life, I suddenly feel that the people who got married earlier in life and who came here after marriage were much better off in life. They got their green cards and citizenship faster. When they landed here, they had a nice house or at least an apartment, even if they rented an apartment, they had an apartment of their own, I mean, with their spouses, and they didn't have to live with all these narrow-minded, stupid roommates. And when they felt sick, they had someone to take care of them, and they had a car, and they would go on all these romantic weekend trips and do all these things together. They were much, much better off in life, as opposed to those who came here alone and had to suffer with all these stupid roommates. So... That's just my bit of advice. In almost every way, it's wiser if you can get married and come here so you'll at least have the stability of a family. And usually they're also financially better off. So they can do a PhD, they can do whatever they want, you know, without worrying about, you know, financial constraints. So, um, that's just my bit of advice. And that brings us to the end of this video about finding good roommates, and I hope you make the right decisions, right choices, get the roommate agreement in place, and I hope you find good roommates, and I hope you will be good roommates to others, and be considerate to other people, and if your roommates are treating you like trash, remember, a lot of people have, have been through this, it's just a passing phase, and um, sometimes, if it's not working out, better you move out. Don't wait for something really bad to happen. And, you know, don't always think of best case scenario. Plan for worst case scenario too. So live in the practical world. Don't live in an ideal world where everyone is nice. Live in the practical world where a lot of things can go really wrong. So I wish you the very best in finding good roommates. Thank you.